Good morning, good to see you all. My name is Christina Malik. I'll be reading from the book of 1 Samuel this morning. 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath. And Goliath said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And David heard him. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And Goliath moved forward and came near to David, with his shield bearer in front of him. And when he saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And Goliath said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with the sticks? Come to me, and I will give you the flesh to the, your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of this field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Samuel 18. And Saul took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy and musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. This is the word of the Lord. And thank you, Christina. So the reading today is a famous one. And, and you know, if, if you attended church at all as a kid and you remember nothing from childhood Sunday school, you probably remember that story, right? David and Goliath. It's one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament for sure. And, and um, we're actually not preaching about that today. We're, we're moving on to the next story in the chapter. But it sets up what happens in where we're going today. So we are going to be zooming in on First and Second Samuel in today's message and talking about David, uh, King David, a day, uh, who was known throughout the Bible as a, as a man after God's own heart. In other words, he loved God, he loved God's law, he wanted to follow where God wanted to take him. So basically, First and Second Samuel, those books in your Old Testament, they serve as a bridge between the book of Judges, which you heard Pastor Paul talk about last week, Time of Judges was chaos and bloodshed and violence, and, and in fact, Paul read the verse for you last week, everybody did what was right in his own eyes, and a generation grew up that did not know Yahweh, the Lord, at all. And so there's a lot of chaos. And so you get to the book of 1 Samuel, and Samuel basically is the final judge. He's the last of the judges. And at this point, the people are just sick of the chaos and the lack of organization. And so the people of Israel say to Samuel, we want a king. Please give us a king. All the other nations have kings. We want a king too. And so this was not God's plan. God was supposed to be their king, but they didn't like God as king. They wanted an earthly king. 
And so God said, fine, I'll give you what you asked for as long as you know what you're asking for. He's going to tax you. He's going to pull you into his armies. He's going to, well, think about the IRS and the federal government. That's what he's going to do to you, okay? So they said, no, 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 we want the king. Okay, so he gave him a king. So the first king was a man named Saul, okay? So here's kind of the flow of the story. You go from the book of Judges to the Samuel as the final judge to King Saul and then finally to King David. This is kind of our flow of the story so far. And all the things we're talking about today happen in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. So Saul starts off as a good king. He's a good king at first. He loves God. He's trying to do what's right. He's trying to lead well. But the longer the story goes, the worse Saul gets. It gets bad after a while. So bad, God says, we're done with Saul. And he's going to appoint David to be the next king. And today, in the story we're looking at today, it's the last couple years of Saul's reign, and it's not good. Things are, things are falling apart. And um, this, the story we're going to talk about takes place after David kills Goliath. So you heard the setup that Christina just read for us. Uh, this is before David is king, but after he kills Goliath. So it's kind of this in-between time. And we're going to zoom in today on one event from David's life where David made some terrible decisions. Terrible decisions. And what I'm hoping that you'll see in David's life is something that's true for all of us. And here's what I want you to discover today. It is most difficult to trust the Lord when you are angry, isolated, or afraid. That's when it is most difficult to trust the Lord. Very difficult to make good decisions, to follow where God's leading, to obey the Lord. It is very hard to do it when you're feeling one of these three things. Angry, anger, loneliness, and fear have the ability to lead you to crash through every moral boundary you may have set up in your life. Drive right past the guardrails into the ditch in your relationships, with your finances, the decisions you make at work, your friendships with with other people. And I am willing to bet that if I asked you, and I won't, so don't worry, but if I asked you to tell us the story of your greatest regret in life, probably one of these three was going on. One or all of these, and and I hate to say this, but you probably have some future regrets coming up or one of these is involved too. (laughs) You don't get a pass on these. They, they, They affect all of us. Because when one of these get a hold of you, loneliness and anger, bitterness, fear, anxiety, you feel compelled to do something. In fact, you feel compelled to do almost anything just to relieve the pressure, relieve the tension that you're experiencing in your heart and in your life. And what you'll probably do is follow your natural instincts. You'll just go on autopilot, right? Whatever you did the last time you felt this way. And as you can imagine, things don't get better when you do that. We don't make good decisions. In fact, they usually get worse. You end up with more regret, not less regret. You end up angrier, lonelier, and afraidier. That's not a word, but it kind of rhymed, so I had to go with it. So the most famous story about David's failures happens in his 50s. David has two, two in particular that are really big, and the one in his 50s is with um, a woman named Bathsheba, who he commits adultery with and then murders her husband. It's a terrible story. But we're not going to talk about that one today. That's the most famous story of David's failures. The story we're, we're focusing on today happens when he's about 22 years old. And it's after the battle with Goliath, David defeats Goliath when he's 15 years old, okay? So for all of you keeping score in your life and you're wondering when you're going to peak, David is 15 when he killed Goliath and became the most famous man in the country, all right? He's the most famous man in Israel. They're writing songs about him. You just heard Christina read that, right? And Saul sees, Saul is getting nervous. Saul is seeing how popular and influential David is becoming. And Saul is becoming an insecure and jealous leader. He, he starts sending David on these dangerous missions against the Philistines, kind of hoping he'll die in battle. And, oh, isn't that sad? David's dead. But David doesn't die. He keeps completing the tasks. His popularity keeps increasing. He thinks, maybe if I get David to marry into my family, then I'll keep him close, right? So David ends up marrying one of Saul's daughters, a young woman named Michal, M-I-C-H-E-L, Michal. And um, David and, and uh, Michal have children together, and he's, now he's... He's King Saul's son-in-law, and he's best friends. David is best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. So so David is intimately connected with Saul's family, 
And so Saul is kind of back and forth. Like sometimes you read in 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, like Saul trusts David and he, and he asks him to do things for him and he, and he trusts him to do them. Other times he's literally trying to kill him, okay? So Saul's kind of back and forth here. And Jonathan and Michal keep warning David. When they know that Saul's on a rampage, they go to David and they say, dude, you got to get out of town. It's going to be bad. So one day, they're having a big family dinner. I don't know what that looked like in the palace, but Saul loses it. All right? And that's where we're going to pick up the story today. 1 Samuel 20. Saul's anger flared up at his son, Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. This isn't in the children's Bible, by the way. We did this one. I, I kind of, I've, I've often wondered, was his mom like sitting at the table when he said that? Like, awkward, you know. There are some marriage issues here, okay? Let's just say that. So Saul is furious, and the reason he's so mad is because he keeps trying to capture David, and his, his own kids keep warning David about what's coming, and so David keeps slipping through his fingers. And, and so Saul continues, don't you, don't I know this is Saul speaking. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse, David, to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? Right, that's another great one-liner. Don't try this. Sorry. It's like Thanksgiving. I'm going to quote the Bible. Don't read this story. So remember, so every king back then, multiple wives. I mean, they got lots of wives running around. And, and friends, this is what happens if you have a favorite wife, okay? So gentlemen, look, piece of advice. Don't let them know which one's your favorite. That's just, that's not going to go well for you, okay? It did not go well here. This is bad. Inter-family arguments and tension and hatreds and jealousies. Anyway, so Saul's had it. You are all working with David behind my back, and he's furious. So he goes on. As long as David lives on this earth, neither you, Jonathan, nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him for me. David must die. See, Saul wants his son Jonathan to be the next king. Saul's legacy is at stake here. David has to die because otherwise he's going to be in competition for the throne. But Jonathan goes to David and he says, David, man, my dad, my dad wants you dead. And, and it's not a little thing. You've got to get out of town. You need to pack up your stuff and you need to hit the road, okay? Saul is not going to rest until you're dead. So, David is 22 years old. He is running for his life. He is alone. He has been rejected by Saul, a man that he has served faithfully. David served Saul faithfully. He wasn't trying to undermine Saul. He is being now hunted by a nation that he risked his life for. And in this story, David has done nothing wrong. He hasn't done anything to deserve this treatment, right? So David is feeling abandoned, angry, and afraid. And David did what many of us would do when we're feeling that way. He lost sight of who he was and whose he was. He lost sight. These three friends are a dangerous combination. David forgot that God was with him, forgot that God could be trusted, and forgot that God was in control. And so, as a result, he panicked. He panicked. Now, it is easy for you and I to stand at 30,000 feet and look back in history and go, David, what a, what a doof. Oh, I mean, come on, David. How could you not trust the Lord? I mean, we sit here in our comfortable seats in an air-conditioned building. Oh, David, so silly. Why would you make such a poor choice, David? Why would you abandon your morals and your principles? Then again, there may be people looking at you right now wondering the same thing. In fact, if you looked back on those regrets in your life, maybe you'd ask yourself the same question. Why did I do that? What was I thinking? You ever done that before? Look back when you had a moment of clarity and thought, what was I thinking when I did that? Why did I steal that? I knew it was wrong. I shouldn't have taken it. Why did I do that? Why did I call him? I knew how that was going to end. Why did I do it? Why did I lie to them about that? Why did I agree to meet her? Why did I go to that party? Why did I borrow all that money? You knew better. Why do you do that? Why do we do that? 
And the answer, friends, listen, the answer is not that complicated. When you are feeling this way, when you are feeling abandoned, angry, afraid, your natural instinct is to panic and make bad decisions. And that's what David did. So here's what happened. All right, story continues. First Samuel 21. David went to the town of Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Now, a little backstory here. You think of Jerusalem as like the capital of Israel, but at this time in the story, in history, they hadn't captured Jerusalem yet. It was still held by a foreign power. So there was no capital city. So the tabernacle, which was the tent where they worshiped Yahweh, and the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the gold box from Indiana Jones, that traveled around the country. And right now, it's in the city of Nob. So the priests are all located here. Ahimelech is one of the priests. Okay, so here's what happens. David comes to town, and Ahimelech trembled when David walked in, David met him, and, and Ahimelech said, why are you here alone? How come nobody's with you? David's a big deal, friends. Everywhere he went, there was like a parade. There was an entourage. He was surrounded by bodyguards and trumpeters and king's liaisons. So if David's alone, something's wrong, and Ahimelech knows it. And David answers Ahimelech, and he lies. David answered Ahimelech the priest, but, but he lies. Now, David knows that lying is wrong. He knows the Ten Commandments. David loves God. He loves God's law. So why does he lie? Because he's afraid, and he's alone, and he's angry. David lies lies to Ahimelech, and here's what he tells him. David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. I'm on a secret mission. This is a lie, of course. Continues, as for my men, I, I, told them to, uh, I told them to meet me at a certain place. Story sounded a little vague here. He doesn't have any men. He's lying. This lie, which seems so harmless, is going to bring about some huge consequences. See, that's the problem with a lie, isn't it? You don't know where it's going to lead. And it starts off innocent, and it starts off as a quick way to get out of some trouble. It starts off as a quick way to avoid consequences, Then they start piling up, and you don't know where it's going to lead, and David did not know where this would lead. Story continues. Now then, David says, what do you have on hand? Do you have some bread? I'm looking for a couple loaves of bread, whatever you can find. Ahimelech's thinking, what? You're on a secret mission for the king? You don't have any food? Right? This is weird, right? And Ahimelech answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand, but there's some consecrated bread here. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. This is like what we would call like communion bread. This is bread dedicated for the temple. He says, I I got some special bread for the Sabbath that the priests eat. You can have that. It goes on. Then David says, hey, thanks for the bread. You don't happen to have a spear or a sword here, do you? I I forgot my sword and I don't have any weapons because the king's mission was urgent. I, you know, I just forgot my sword. You don't happen to have an extra one lying around, do you? David's lies are piling up, aren't they? He's looking for a weapon and right here, the story comes full circle. Ahimelech says, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the Valley of Elah, is here. This is seven years ago. Now, if you were watching this in a movie, this is where the music would change. This is the weapon that David used to cut off Goliath's head. He hit him in the head with a stone. Goliath falls down. David took his sword and cut his head off. And David kept the sword of Goliath as a souvenir. And later he dedicated it to God and it went around with the tabernacle. He kept it in the tent. It was dedicated to God because David knew that God had rescued him. So the sword now traveled around with the tabernacle. And in this story, this is a powerful literary device. Because when you hear about the sword that Goliath used, memories are supposed to come flooding back about the, the message we read earlier that you heard Christina read. About David's, when, when David had such humble confidence in God, he was just a shepherd boy. No armor, no sword, just some slings. And he's so confident because he trusted God. He trusted in God's salvation. And you're meant to think to yourself right now when you read this, you're meant to think, what happened to that kid? What happened to that kid who so confidently trusted the Lord? What happened to the boy who said so confidently, it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. What happened to that David? The, the David, he said this to Goliath and the Philistines right before that battle. 
The David who sang, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. My trust is in you, Lord, all day long. What happened? Same thing that happens to you, friends. You know this. That anger, loneliness, fear gets a hold of you. And those three have the potential to make you forget God's faithfulness, to make you forget what God has done for you in the past, and to make some bad choices. Now, Ahimelech gives David this extraordinary visual reminder. Hey, the sword of Goliath. But David misses it. And like says, it's, yeah, that sword, Goliath's sword, is wrapped up in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here except that one. The ephod was a robe that the priest wore. So it's like in the back of the closet, in other words, right? And you take that if you want. So David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. And that is going to become a decision that David's going to regret for the rest of his life. And I bet you can relate to that moment because you can think of a few of those too, can't you? So David lies, he forgets about the Lord, he doesn't trust God, he takes matters into his own hand, he's going to do it himself, he forgets that God can be trusted when the world seems out of control. And right here is a good time to stop and pause for just a minute, because I'm willing to bet, you, if you grew up in the church, there may have been a time in your teens or in your 20s when you really, you really were just on fire for God, maybe at some point in the past. Or maybe you're a teenager now, and you're, you're listening in this morning, and, and I want to speak to the young people and recall all of you back to your younger days, if you, if you really trusted the Lord a lot when you were younger. When you were in your teens, your 20s, you were just fired up about Jesus. Isn't it easy to trust God when nothing's on the line? Isn't it easy to trust God when there's nothing at stake? Right? It is easy to trust God when you have nothing to trust him with and nothing to trust him for. You remember, many of you, maybe you went to camp. Any summer campers in here? You know we're talking about Camp Lone Star. You went to summer camp. You committed your life to Christ. And, and you're like, God, I'm just going to give you my life. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you my life, God. And God says, well, I'll take it, but it's not much to give, is it? I mean, what do you got when you give your life to Christ when you're like 17? I got like 50 bucks for the stuff in my room, and I'm driving my mom's car. You know what I mean? It's a lot harder to trust God when the things you value, the things you depend on, the, the things you trust in start to slip away. And David is struggling here to trust God, and he's making terrible choices with some terrible consequences. Now, into the story enters another character, a man named Doeg. I don't know, maybe we pronounce that Doug nowadays. I don't know. But Doeg is the guy, D-O-E-G. Doeg is, uh, is Saul's chief herdsman. So you know the king has flocks and herds and cattle and all this, and he's got a chief herdsman who takes care of the king's flocks. And De uh, Doeg is around, and he happens to see what's going on with David and Ahimelech. Doeg sees David meet with Ahimelech. And he goes to King Saul and he says, Ahimelech gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Doeg goes to Saul and he says, hey, Saul, you're not going to believe what I just saw. I'm sorry to tell you this, but Ahimelech turned against you. He gave David food. He gave David weapons. He prayed with David and tried to give him godly advice. And when Saul hears this, Saul is furious at Ahimelech. The king sent for the priest of Ahimelech and all the men of his family who were the priests of Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, Ahimelech? You and the son of Jesse, you gave him bread and a sword. You inquired of God for him so that he has rebelled against me. He is lying in wait for me just as he is today. My son is against me. My daughters are against me. My chief priest is now against me. Notice now that it's Saul who is filled with anger, loneliness, isolation, and fear. And now he's making terrible choices. Ahimelech is clueless. He has no idea what's going on, right? So Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David? He's, he's your son-in-law, for goodness sake. He's the captain of your bodyguard. He's highly respected in your household. Ahimelech's like, I don't know what you're talking about, Saul. David is not rebelling against you. And furthermore... Was that day the first time I ever inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family. Now, 
Again, you've probably been anxious, lonely, or afraid before. You can think of times in your life like that. And I just want to ask you, have you ever been in that situation and assumed the worst about other people? You know what I'm saying? Like, you could read their mind and you knew what they were thinking. And it was always bad, right? Now, we're all mature, wise people. I'm sure you've never done that before. But this is what Saul's doing right here, right? And Himelech is clueless. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't conspire with David. He just asked for some bread and a sword. I met with him a bunch of times. Your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said to Ahimelech, you will surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. Ahimelech says, I don't know what you're talking about. But Saul is angry, isolated, and afraid, paranoid. And then Saul makes a terrible decision. Look at this. The king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill all the priests of the Lord because they too have sided with David. Saul's guards refused to kill the priests because they're like, this is not right. You don't kill God's priests. You don't do that. But Doeg, looking for a chance to advance, Doeg says, I'll do it. He pulls out a sword and he kills 85 priests of God right there in Saul's courtyard. And then Doeg goes to the town of Nob and he kills every man, woman, and child in the town who's connected with the priests. Only one man escaped the slaughter. It was one of Ahimelech's sons. He runs to David and tells David what happened. And David knows immediately that his choices have caused this disaster. David knows this is his fault. Listen to the weight. Can you feel the weight of David's confession here? I am responsible for the death of your family. David's bad choices, his lies, his impulsive, fearful decisions have led to disaster for other people. And and you've seen that happen. There are times in everybody's life, all of our lives, when anger, isolation, fear, loneliness pushes us to do things we would never do, to do things that we know aren't right. And if we were thinking clearly, we never would have made that choice, right? So here's the question. What is your anger, loneliness, or fear leading you to consider that you know isn't right? That something in your relationship, something with your finances, something about your physical health, risky behaviors you're considering, something with your marriage, if you're in school right now, your classwork, you're feeling overwhelmed, you're making bad decisions about money, an old habit that you spent weeks or years trying to break, and now you're stepping back into it again. Or here's another question. Who is your loneliness, anger, or fear leading you to consider that you know you should stay away from who? It's not always a what. Sometimes it's a who. You're thinking about calling him back, aren't you? You're thinking about texting her because you're lonely. you got a group of friends that you love to have a beer with, but you know when you get with them, you do dumb things. You've got girlfriends or guy friends, and every time they're around, they're giving you bad advice. Yeah, you should tell her off. No, I, you, I, you, I wouldn't put up with that man. I'd tell him what to do. Don't listen to those bozos. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the thing about these choices that we make, they don't just impact you, do they? Those choices don't just impact you. So who besides you? Your considerations put at risk. Who do those bad decisions put at risk besides you? And the answer, the people you love the most and the people that love you the most. That's who's at risk from those choices, right? Some of you, again, you know we could raise our hands. You know this from personal experience because you've hurt the people you love and they have hurt you because of the choices they make. Maybe you grew up in a house and you just had to deal with your dad's anger all the time growing up, and you've been dealing with your dad's anger ever since. You've been out of that house for 25 years, and you're still dealing with it. Maybe your mom had a drinking problem, and her alcoholism or addiction got a hold of her, and you've been out of that house for 40 years, and you're still carrying around the burdens that you grew up with. Whose future hangs in the balance based on the decisions that you're making? One last question. What advice would you give someone in your position? Think about this for just a minute. Isn't it always easier to look at somebody else's life and give them clear advice than it is to see your own life and give you advice? Like you can't see it when it's you. It's so clear when it's somebody else. And I think part of the reason for that is that we always think of ourselves as the exception. 
Like we're like, I know the risk, but it's different with me. I got this. Can I tell you the truth this morning? You're not the exception. You are not the exception. You are a unique person, okay? But your experiences are common to just about everybody else in this room. There are people in here who've been through what you've been through or something real similar. So in your situation right now, you probably know what the right thing to do is. David certainly knew what the right thing to do is. He had already given advice to other people, all the advice he needed. David is the man who had written this in the Psalms. David said, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Not alcohol, not an affair, not a new car, not a better house, not a bunch more debt, not some more pills. The Lord is your refuge. David says, he is a stronghold in times of trouble. A stronghold is a place you flee in times of war. God is the place where you run. When you feel oppressed, when you feel weighed down, God is your refuge when you are angry, alone, or afraid. David wrote that those who know your name, Lord, they trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Friends, David would tell you this morning, if he were standing up here, he would tell you, I trusted my ability to control the situation and weasel my way through it. I thought I had been forsaken by God, and I was wrong. I was wrong. David would say to you and I right now, friends, don't make the same mistake. The Lord has not abandoned you. God knows your situation. He knows that you are angry or lonely or afraid. He knows this already. But you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to David even. A thousand years after David, David's most famous descendant, born in the city of David, Bethlehem, David's most famous descendant would look into the eyes of an angry, frightened, and lonely Jewish crowd and Jesus would say to them the same thing he says to you, come to me. Listen to that phrase. David said, the Lord is a refuge. Jesus says, I am your refuge. Notice how he puts himself in the place of God. Come to me. Come to me, you who are weak and heavy laden, weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Think about the implication. Jesus says, I will give you rest. Rest. Doesn't that sound like something you need? Not a vacation, not a break from hard work. Rest for your soul. This is what Jesus says. Listen to him. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When you feel forsaken, David, Jesus, would tell you, you are not forsaken, you are not alone. Don't listen to that voice. It's not telling you the truth. God is with you. God is calling you to himself. God is a refuge for the oppressed. David said, the Lord is a refuge, your stronghold in times of trouble. David would tell you, don't run. Instead, remember. This is why Jesus' people prioritize weekly gatherings on Sunday mornings. Did you know that? We don't come to church because then God checks the box and goes, okay, 32 times this year, as long as you get above 50%, you're good. That's not what church is about. The reason we gather together in worship is because we need the reminder week in, week out, that God is a stronghold for the, for the weary and the oppressed, that God is our refuge. That's why we're here. We need to be in this place as often as possible to be fed and find rest for our souls. That's why worship is so important. That's why small groups are so important. You need to be surrounded by people whose voices will lead you towards your heavenly father, not your buddies who will lead you away. You need some friends in your life who will speak loving truth to you. You need your heavenly father, and we need each other to speak truth when we're feeling angry, isolated, and alone. Can I beg you, friends, those of you listening online who are joining us, thank you. Can I just beg you to make weekly worship a priority for your own sake? And if you are not in a small group, to get connected to one and trust your heavenly father. Remember what God has done for you. The Lord is a refuge, David said, for the oppressed. Your stronghold in times of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let me pray for you, friends. Jesus, we want to come to you this morning right now. And the first thing we want to confess is that in so many cases in our lives, when we are isolated, when we are angry, when we're anxious or afraid, we just make terrible choices. We don't know our right hand from their left. And, and if we were looking at somebody else doing this, we would see so clearly, don't do that. But when it's us, we, we don't even see it. We don't know what we're thinking. So God, this morning, I wanna ask for anybody in this room who's listening in online, anybody listening right now who's in the middle of a lonely, isolated, angry situation, that you would bring clarity to them and peace. That you would call them to yourself that you would prevent them from making foolish choices that impact the people they love and themselves. And God, for all of us, as we continue to live our lives, we're gonna end up in that situation if we're not in it today, probably tomorrow or next week or a month from now. We need you, Father. Would you bring clarity and peace? Would you lead our hearts to you to find refuge instead of our own control and power and manipulation? Father, would you make us your children? That gulf is too wide for us to cross on our own. You must do it for us. You must redeem. You must save. You must rescue. And so, God, we cry out to you for that rescue and strength and then ask for power to live as your people. Send us in that power today. In Jesus' name.